I am, so we're going to get started here. Welcome back. I turn my camera on really fast here so you can see me. Welcome back to the Hot Topics in Flood Risk Management webinar series. Today's webinar is Unsheltered Populations Living in Flood Control Systems. We will hear from Andrew Trelease of the Clark County Regional Flood Control District on keeping people away from floods in Las Vegas, and Trevor Snyder of U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, on unsheltered populations living in a flood risk management project. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes at the end for Q&A or uh, open discussion. Um, and with that, keep everything moving smoothly here. I'll, uh, I'll hand it off to Danae Olson and Jess Edwards of the U.S. Army Corps to give a quick Silver Jackets overview. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And good morning, everyone. Uh, pardon the, the sausage making there uh, early on. Glad um, we're all able to make it and we're here together. I'm Danae Olson. I work with the Army Corps of Engineers out of the Sacramento District in our flood risk management program. And I'm really excited to be hosting today's topic. This is a really critical topic on unsheltered populations living in the floodplain. Um, and so real quick, wanted to provide a, an overview of silver jackets for you all. So let me get there. All right, so if you haven't heard, uh, Silver Jackets is an interagency program, and the purpose of the program is to bring uh, federal, state, regional, local, tribal uh, partners together uh, with a common goal of reducing flood risk through non-structural means. So through Silver Jackets, we have a whole host of different types of activities that we do, emergency action planning support, floodplain management planning, uh, tons of education and outreach. You may have heard of uh, the high watermark campaign um, that we that we had through Nevada Silver Jackets uh, last year, and um, we're still reaping the benefits of that, uh, seeing signs be installed across the state of Nevada and uh, hosting some pretty awesome um, unveiling events. Um, and so the name Silver Jackets came from uh, when partners respond to an emergency, if uh, maybe specifically a flood emergency, and they're kind of each wearing their own color jacket. So maybe uh, FEMA is wearing blue and the Corps of Engineers is wearing red, um, and you have um, other partners wearing different colors. And so the idea was to the come up with come a, up color a color like, uh, that's like uh, common to common all of us all and of us. to have, there's a little bit of an echo coming through, not sure, there we go. And um, and so it's uh, we came up with the the silver uh, jacket like we all put on our silver jackets many partners one team uh, all with the common goal of showing up and seeing how we can help and meet meet the needs um, of um, those in need so uh, silver jackets teams are state led and so the nevada silver jackets is led by the nevada division of water resources and the type of projects that fall under uh, the program are usually 12 to 18 months long they move very quickly and we have annual very competitive uh, proposal cycles um, that are done at a national level um, every state has a silver jackets team including the u.s territories and um, so we've had a lot of awesome projects over the years um, and the part the projects are built using in-kind support so i think what that means but i set up the ta someone has a hot mic there um you your effort yet so what that means is um the working kind support can come as the partners agreeing to attend meetings. Uh, could be that they're agreeing to um, review materials that are being developed or to present on a topic. Um, all sorts of great opportunities to you know provide working kind support, and so that's that's how the proposals are put together, and um, they're usually submitted in the spring. And if you have more questions about silver jackets or as you're listening in today, if something comes up for you and you think, oh, I would love to do something similar to this for my community or something uh, comes to mind and you want to um, have a sounding board to just uh, kind of see if it's an option through silver jackets, feel free to reach out to me um, and we can uh, talk more. All right. And with that, I will pass it to my colleague, uh, Mr. Jess Edwards. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Danae. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just highlight our uh, project that uh, Danae mentioned, our high watermark campaign. 
we've had opportunity to uh, reach into many communities and uh, create signage uh, with help with uh, education and outreach. Most recently, we had a big uh, uh, high water mark sign and unveiling ceremony at, at prehistoric Lake Lahontan. Shout out to Debbie Niedenreep and uh, Lindsay Marsh for helping coordinate that. Uh, where we brought out a um, hundred middle school kids, and uh, we had a, a bunch of uh, science related booths set up uh, for the kids to learn everything from geology to uh, flood floodplain management to uh, the importance of floodplains, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, topics, and uh, it was really high successful. Uh, we had a representative from the state senator's office, and uh, uh, yeah, it was just a really cool project. Um, and if uh, any of your communities are interested in something like that, we can still we still have uh, opportunities to continue this project forward through our current uh, Nevada Watershed University campaign. Um, and next slide, please. I would like to bring your attention to our NevadaFloods.org website that has a plethora of information on classroom curriculum uh, for kids and uh, also for adults, uh, lots of good information there. We also have uh, story maps on history of uh, major flood events that occurred in, in Nevada uh, and the different rivers, major rivers. Uh, so I recommend uh, if you haven't checked out that website, there's, like I said, tons of great information in there uh, for uh, educational opportunities. Next slide. Just to recap uh, the types of projects that uh, Silver Jackets can do, uh, floodplain mapping and hazard assessments for uh, different areas. Uh, we can do flood planning studies and watershed assessments, emergency action planning, tabletop exercises, and again, uh, education outreach, which is a big part of our Silver Jackets program, which brings us to uh, today's topic, our summer series hot topics on the unsheltered living and flood control systems. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Andrew Trelease from the Clark County Regional Flood Control District, Assistant General Manager, to tell us a little bit about what uh, insights that he has on this. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. I'll try to share my screen here. And okay, can you can you see that? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Excellent. OK, uh, uh, before I get started, because I'll probably forget to say this as I go, um, a big thanks to all the public works agencies here in Southern Nevada for all the great work they do. And uh, specifically Clark County Public Works, they provided me a lot of information for this presentation. Uh, Clint Spencer, I think, is online and uh, uh, Public Works Director Dennis Cedarberg provided a lot of pictures to sort of help us understand the problem that they deal with out in the in the real world. So I'll jump right in. I'm. I'm Andrew Trelease, uh, Assistant General Manager of the Regional Flood Control District. A uh, little bit about who the Flood Control District is. Uh, we're a planning and funding organization that was set up in the mid 1980s. Uh, we're funded by a quarter per, quarter of one percent sales tax, which uh, last fiscal year should be around 160 million dollars uh, for annually. Uh, we're a very small organization, as I mentioned. We're not the public works agencies. We're uh, we we fund the design, construction, and maintenance of the major flood control facilities in Clark County. But uh, the boots on the ground are from the member entities around uh, Clark County. So what is flood control? Um, I think everyone on this call knows that we don't really control floods, even though that's the name on the door. Uh, what we try to do, we don't even actually reduce the hazards. Uh, it rains, it floods. We try to take that runoff and put it where we think is somewhere safer, somewhere safer than on the roads, in people's houses, in businesses, and things like that. So, so we're not really controlling floods, but we're we're doing the best we can. Uh, we try to keep the floods away from the people with our capital improvement program. And right now, we have about uh, 713 miles of channels and storm drains in Clark County and 110 detention basins. And then the other thing we do is we try to keep people away from floods, and that's with our uh, outreach and education program. And uh, why do we need outreach and education? Well, as we know, uh, we 
can't keep up with development always, and so we might have incomplete systems. Sometimes it rains more than we designed for. Sometimes, unfortunately, the the systems don't don't really act the way we want them to, and uh, it's difficult to know you know what's under the water when you're driving, and uh, we flash flooding occurs very quickly. Uh, these are sort of the physical reasons why uh, we need the outreach and education, but there's also behavioral reasons. I mean, people are sometimes just unaware of how dangerous the water is when they're driving through it or walking through it, or or maybe it's raining upstream and they're, they don't realize that, you know, that it could be flooding where they are just because it's not raining where they are. Uh, a lot of times we get reports, people are aggressive, they're impatient, they just want to get through it and just, you know, or they panic and just hit the gas. Uh, but then there's also, you know, people that are intentionally going into our flood control facilities and why, well, maybe they're explorers and this looks neat and I'm, or maybe they're vandals or, or maybe they're just trying to get out of the heat. And so they're trying to seek shelter. So these are all reasons why people would intentionally enter our facilities. But our normal public outreach is extremely uh, robust here at the Regional Flood Control District. And we have big social media presence. So we have community events and and billboards and, and, and TV, radio. Uh, we visit schools. Uh, all kinds of, of things that we do to try to get the message out. And we think we hit all of the demographics that we are we are targeting here in Southern Nevada. But one of those demographics is the the people that are intentionally trespassing into our facilities. And you know, they know it's extremely dangerous. They probably know better than we do. If they're living in a storm drain, I have a feeling it's a lot more they 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 they're much more aware of the dangers than I am. But for sure they're still choosing to do that. So even though we might be hitting with our messages, it doesn't matter. They're going to choose to go in there anyway. There are homeless advocacy groups in Southern Nevada that try to reach out and uh, and and contact with these people, connect with them, try to get them help, try to get them into transitional housing, try to get them into shelters, things like that. That's somewhat successful, but it's a it's a obviously a very big challenge. And it's not just dangerous for them; it's also dangerous for the community because the the things that they bring into the system makes our system less reliable. So a little bit about homelessness in Southern Nevada. This is from 2023, January. Um, it should be pretty similar to 2024. We don't have that data yet, but essentially it's estimated there's about 6,500 uh, people experiencing homelessness in Southern Nevada. About 60% of those are unsheltered and about over 500 people are estimated to be living in flood control facilities at one point in time. So what do we try to do, we try to keep them out because as we mentioned, you know, they know the dangers, they're still choosing to go in there. So we have we have fencing, we repair that fencing, we have gates, we have we have uh, locks, we have no trespassing signs, we do everything we can do. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, can we do trash racks, just put, you know, big, a big uh, metal structure in front of these facilities. And we do that in very rare sit situations and the reason that's rare is I can give an example here. This is going into the Harry Reid International Airport. If the if the spaces between those bars are big enough to let the trash through, well, then it's big enough for a person to get through. And if you narrow up that space where the trash or where a person can't get through it, then the trash just builds up on it. It just it can't get through. This is a situation. It just it just can't even the, the water can't even drain out of there. And unfortunately, in this particular situation, in this in this location, there's been several uh, deaths of people actually getting caught up on that trash rack during storm events in the last few years, and that's extremely sad. Uh, and then a lot of people will say, "Why don't you just have warning systems? Why don't you have you know sirens and lights and things like that?" Turns on when uh, when you know when when it's about to rain. Well, besides being a big liability and not addressing the 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 fact that they're going to bring in their belongings as well, not just themselves. It, it just happens too fast. And here's an example of, of things that we deal with in Southern Nevada. You know, a sunny day, everything's great. And then next thing you know, boom. It's a rain bomb, we call it, or, or a microburst. I mean, there's just no chance. I mean, that, that happened, that was a time lapse. That happened over about a half hour. So by the time your siren goes off, it's too late. The wall of water is already in the system, and you know people would be, you know, injured or killed by the time we could we could actually even warn them. So flood related deaths. I mean, I think we we know that you know there's it's extremely you know, flooding is nationally, internationally, biggest national disaster there is. Um, 
we have 27 flood related deaths in Clark County since 1986. Most of those were from people driving through flooded waters, but in the last few years, we're definitely seeing a more vulnerable population is to people actually living in the system. And we've had more uh, of those deaths in the recent years than, than probably even the, the vehicle deaths. So here's an example, uh, one of our engineers checking out a brand new facility with a contractor walking through, looks great. This is how it's supposed to look. Uh, it, you know, a lot, of, a lot of capacity for water to go through there in a, in a rain event. But uh, here's an example of, of, of a cleanup of a homeless encampment. You can see here is the big reveal, you know, what, what, what comes out of these systems. And you know, this this looks really bad, right? So that's one cell of the culvert. And there's just really no opportunity for any water to get through that, right? So that, and this isn't washed in there. This is stuff that was brought into the system. And you might be thinking, wow, that looks crazy, but you know, it's it's probably pretty rare. Well, unfortunately, it's really not that rare. Here's some other examples, some open channels of, of just debris that's brought in. Uh, this is, you know, one thing of note in this one, you can see the black coloration on the on the head wall of that culvert. That's pro, you know, it's from campfires. I mean, smoke inhalations would be a big problem if you're building a fire in one of these things. Obviously, it could damage the concrete over time as well. Uh, certainly something that we that we don't want to see. Here's people living next to the channel. I mean, they're blocking the access road. They're using the channel as a garbage, you know, bin, and that just washes downstream. Big water quality issue, and we can't even get the maintenance crews can't even get access to to this channel because of all the the blockages on the maintenance road. Here's a, another picture right downstream of there. Uh, you know, here's people just living right at the entrance of the culvert. You know, that they're that obviously when it rains, that's that's all going away, and it's very dangerous. Uh, this this person just put up uh, plywood, worked probably pretty well to keep some of the water out, but that facility is going to fail when it rains. That debris and the, that blockage is going to get that water up onto the roads, into businesses, into into homes, uh, make it obviously very dangerous for pedestrians and, and motorists as well. Uh, just underground, so out of sight, out of mind. Well, uh, that might be true, but once you go down there and look and see what's going on in there, I mean, this is this is just a supposedly an operating storm drain system. Obviously, not going to operate very well when it rains. Just uh, just more examples of just stuff that's brought in. So this is this this does not make a very reliable system. Uh, very resourceful. There are human beings that are very intelligent. You know, water and electricity. What could go wrong? Uh, apparently, this person was uh, running a, a mechanic shop in one of our facilities, uh, driving down the access road with cars, changing the oil, and then getting them out of air. <laughs> Obviously, multiple problems with this, and uh, you know it's almost funny if you if you can get past the, the part of that this is supposed to be a flood control facility. Um, access roads, you know, how we get the maintenance equipment to the facilities if they're, if they're completely blocked. Uh, trails and bridges, and these are supposed to be multi-use trails for the public to use in a lot of cases, or just you know debris underneath the bridges. Uh, all kinds of problems, and just you know, just very sad that this is a, a lifestyle that people will be choosing over over a shelter or, or other other places that they might be able to go. So obviously, this is uh, you know just just completely blocking the access roads as well. So. Around 2019, we uh, at the Flood Control District decided to try to track how much maintenance money we're actually spending on cleanups of homeless encampments, and we're we, we've we've got now the the public works agencies uh, are for the most part doing a good job of tracking those costs. We're around two million dollars uh, a year of, of of just maintenance of of homeless encampments, and that's over a budget of of 20 million uh, for the fiscal year 2024, our maintenance budget usually between maybe 15 and 20 million. Uh, of note, special note that the city of Las Vegas, we don't have data on their homeless encampment cleanup. So that number for 2024, if they sort of added their numbers in, would probably be around $3.5 million is what we'd expect. So what do we try to do? We, there's some more things that we've tried to do besides all the things that we mentioned earlier to keep people out. We tried to use this expanded metal fencing. Uh, kind of looks like chain link fencing, but it's a, it's a superior strength. It's hard to cut. It's hard to climb. Um, and it has 
met with some success of keeping people out of our, our systems, but it's extremely expensive. It's probably around five times more than a chain link fence. You know, we're looking at maybe a $150 a, a foot or so. And so here's another example of some of that expanded metal fencing. And that was from that video I showed earlier of all that debris being pulled out of a of a of the one of the cells. But this can't work in a lot of places. You know, this this obviously the how's the water going to get in when a little bit of debris? I mean, we'll take one leaf to to clog this up. So so we don't have this opportunity to to keep people out with with systems like this in in many places in town. So back in 2022, the city of, uh, of North Las Vegas uh, tried a pilot program where they went out to one of their uh, their homeless, their big homeless encampments, did a big cleanup. They spent about $80,000 on death, just that one cleanup, including the, the maintenance and all the support services. And then once that was done, they uh, hired a private security company to patrol the that section of the channel uh, at least once per day, um, just to just to shoo people away, keep them from setting up camp, keep them from being in harm's way. And that's has worked really well. Uh, they, they, the, to this day, we're kind of keeping an eye on that. And, and, and they're the people in the neighborhood that lived in there were very happy the way things were. The North Las Vegas was very happy with the way it worked. Uh, we think, you know, that there's a lot of benefits to this. I mean, we, you know, there's, we're trying to keep the debris out, trying to keep the people out. Uh, and it's a big risk to the people like that are actually doing this maintenance, doing this cleanup. I mean, you know, come to Las Vegas and see the Blue Man Group. You know, it's like, it's a great show I hear. But, uh, you know, this is the sort of off strip version of that. You know, it's, it's very dangerous down there. It's, you know, there's, there's not a lot of oxygen. There's, there's potential for disease. There's all kinds of stuff down there that we are, is very dangerous. It's just not meant for, for humans to be down there. So the remaining challenges, you know, obviously we're not we're not solving the problem of homelessness by just kicking people out of the facility, and we're we're just trying to keep it, the 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 systems reliable. We're trying to protect them from themselves, um, but we know it's very dangerous down there. And so, uh, it, and you know, the security patrols they can't go and uh, and patrol hundreds of miles of underground storm drains. We know that there's definitely challenges there, but. For the most part, it seems to be working pretty well so far. And then uh, our board of directors in January 2023 sort of said this program is a success. Let's 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 move it uh, forward. Let's let the other entities. So now, uh, Clark County and uh, the city of Henderson are also uh, using uh, this uh, security protocol or security patrols to 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 p patrol the the certain facilities and it's worked pretty well so far we don't have a lot of data yet to show how effective it is but in our minds if we're even if we're spending the same amount of money we're making a more reliable system and we're saving people's lives so we think it's a good program and it's just something that we're trying to do that's a little bit outside the box and uh, with that i i'm done with this presentation i can move it on to trevor's next i'll stop sharing All right, thanks so much, Andrew. Okay. Uh, um, are you guys, today, are, are, you, are you guys gonna share my, my slides? Yep, we can do that. Give me just a minute to pull that back up here. Thank you. We can barely hear Trevor. Yeah, the audio is a little quiet, Trevor. Okay, can you hear me a little bit better? Um, it's 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 okay. It's just a, a little little quiet, but um, you can go ahead and try again. I'll try and to we speak can... loud. Okay, that's great. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um. Well, I, I'm gonna wow everybody with my amazing uh, PowerPoint skills. Um. Good morning, my name is Trevor Snyder. I'm the program manager for the US Army Corps of Engineers in Los Angeles County. Uh, I operate and maintain uh, six dams, one degree basin and 40 engines. I have served as the Army Corps of Engineers homeless encampment liaison since uh, September of 2020. Um, I'm here to talk about our program and and sort of why the Army Corps of Engineers is involved in homeless encampment work. Um, I'm currently supported by a 
uh, new liaison who works for us, who also manages our rivers and channels. His name is Julio Ramos, and his point of contact information will be at the very end of this uh, uh, presentation. And I'll be sure to put my information to the chat as well. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about our agenda for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. I'm gonna discuss our area responsibility within uh, the South Pacific Division Los Angeles District. That's what SPL is. Um, I try to try to get away from uh, using acronyms uh, as much as possible, but uh, after uh, working for the US Army my entire life, uh, that's very hard to do. So if there's something that uh, you don't recognize or I'm saying something wrong, please feel free to uh, write in the chat and I'll I'll type it out and I, I appreciate it. Um, also gonna talk about our, our authorities uh, within the Army Corps of Engineers for management of, um, uh, of a lot of these disabled, um, sorry, displaced uh, uh, homeless encampments, um, the impacts that they have within our flood risk management projects, as well as the surrounding communities. Um, one of the missions of the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, obviously is to serve our communities that we work with. Um, partnerships, which are so incredibly important. I want to talk about how this got started with our Silver Jackets workshop. Um, and this was going back about two and a half years ago and on um, that uh, workshop, which was the creation of a joint protocol for the emergency evacuation of unsheltered populations within our uh, flood risk management projects and uh, and how it really we were able to to uh, utilize that with uh, Tropical Storm Hillary um, in our implementation. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. OK. Great. And Trevor, I'm sorry. I think it would be better actually maybe to turn the video off as wonderful it is as it is to see you. I think there may be a little connection uh, limitation today. So it, we can hear you, but it's it's a bit choppy. So okay. thank you. OK, is that better? I think so. Yeah. OK, yes. thank, thank you. Um, so our operations homeless encampment program footprint. The Los Angeles district operates uh, the southern half of California, all of the state of Arizona, and the, and the southern half of Nevada, and a small sliver of Utah. Altogether, we have 16 dams, 61 miles of channels and levees. We have one debris basin. Our area of responsibility encompasses 226,000 square miles. And I did a, a couple numbers for our homeless point in time count. In the state of California, the homeless point in time count totals 173,800 unsheltered individuals. In Los Angeles County alone, you're, you're looking at over 75,000 of those individuals. And that, I just want to put that into perspective um, how, how big of a problem this is within Los Angeles County. So. Um, the majority of our uh, concerns are within the county of Los Angeles. We do have some in Orange County and San Bernardino and Riverside County, uh, but the majority of, of our shared concern is within Los Angeles County. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some of our guiding, some of our guiding documents and authorities. Um, we are the only uh, um, Army Corps of Engineer district that has an Army regulation on the management of homeless encampments within our Civil Works project lands. Uh, this was created and drafted in October of 2020, and it was published following the Ranch 2 fire. The Ranch 2 fire was a very large fire uh, in the San Gabriel Mountains that actually started on U.S. Army Corps of Engineers property within the San Gabriel River. Uh, it was a argument between uh, two individuals over a stolen bicycle. One said, if I can't have it, uh, you can't have it. I'm gonna burn down your camp. Uh, that individual lit a fire and unfortunately um, it, it spread very quickly, went up into the, to the mountains and it threatened some very large uh, residential communities um, in the upper San Gabriel River area. 
Um, we also have uh, two different authorities under the United States Federal Code, Title 36, which is uh, preventing illegal camping and unauthorized occupation or domiciling within our flood risk management projects. Um, so that is our legal authority to trespass individuals that domicile in very dangerous locations. And then the, the last guiding, guiding document is our interagency collaboration on unsheltered community, uh, Silver Jacket Project, said, where, we create, where we created a uh, joint protocol. And we're going to talk a little bit more down uh, in, into my presentation about that joint protocol and the benefit that we received. I think we have a hot mic. If, if you guys can mute your uh, mute your mics and your, your phone while I'm doing the presentation, I know it's hard enough to hear me. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so th these are some of the, the big impacts that we have with um, illegal domiciling uh, within our flood risk management. So there's a loss of life and it's very tragic. And, and Andrew kind of highlighted some of the uh, loss of life that he has encountered. Same thing with us when we have these major storm events here in Southern California. They happen to be uh, highly localized and, and almost a flash flooding situation. Um, and it's unfortunate that um, individuals will, will seek out um, these flood risk management projects as being one of the, you know, the last sort of urban wilderness uh, areas within Los Angeles County. There's also damage to core infrastructure. Andrew had a, a fantastic photo showing the effects of fire um, in one of, I think that was like a culvert or a storm drain. And as you all know that, you know, fire and concrete do not mix very well and it, it's a problem. Uh, there's an increased fire risk, not only at our locations and sites, but within the local community. So, you know, over the years as um, development has increased in Southern California, there's a lot of uh, encroachment and, and homes built and businesses built along uh, the edge of our flood risk management projects. And it's important that we, as we're servicing our um, uh, our local communities, we try to reduce that fire risk and make uh, the area a lot safer. There's a big problem with floatable debris. Um, and, and again, I'm gonna highlight Andrew's photos. You can see all that trash and debris within um, those storm drains. When it does rain, all that trash accumulates and can uh, can clog up our trash tracks at our dams and uh, actually prevent water from properly flowing from those um, flood risk management uh, facilities. There's safety and security of those visiting our area of responsibility. We have a lot of recreational features, um, trails, uh, bicycle paths, and we want to make sure that those individuals that are visiting our, our properties are able to enjoy the recreational facilities um, for fear, you know, without fear of, of, uh, of any sort of criminal aspect. We, we do get from time to time uh, individuals that are, are, are robbed or, uh, and, and so forth. So, and then of course there's safety and security of the core employees and contractors. So not only just our federal employees, but also our contractors that are doing work within our area. We've had in individuals that were hurt, um, were assaulted, and we wanna make sure that we are uh, keeping those individuals safe. And then the last, but definitely not least, is the damage to environment. Um, within Southern California, we have designated critical habitat for two ESA section seven listed species one is the california gnat catcher which is a threatened species and then we have an endangered bird which is the least bells vireo and the damage to the environment within these um encampments are, are huge um and so we want to make sure that we're being good stewards of the environment and uh making sure that we're, we're keeping um those uh that wildlife able to flourish and, and continue to uh, to grow. Next slide, please. Okay, so partnerships, th this is really important and I, I can't highlight our partnerships enough. Um, my favorite line that I use is uh, when I when I kind of discuss this is 
you know, the, the nine scariest words in the English language that, uh, that Ronald Reagan had mentioned uh, back in the 80s. And he said, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And a lot of times when we're going out there, um, we don't get a very positive reception, um, especially being government employees. Uh, I'll leave it up to your imagination what I'm told to go do to myself quite often. Um, but it's important that we bring a lot of these outreach groups and partners with us to help us out. And so some of some of the um, some of the partnerships I just kind of want to talk about and highlight is, you know, Los, LASA, which is the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, uh, LACADA, which is the Los Angeles Center for Alcohol and Drug Abuse, uh, LA County uh, Department of Public Health. Um, there's two other outreach groups that are tied in with our local uh, city council districts, which is PATH and SELA. We have uh, various uh, uh, homeless outreach agencies that are nonprofit, non government organizations like St. Joseph, Union Station. Um, and then we also bring out a lot of law enforcement because they have different. Um, different resources available to them. They have mental health uh, evaluation teams to try to offer services. And a big one that we really rely on is actually the Department of Veteran Affairs and their homeless outreach. The Department of Veteran Affairs has a wonderful homeless outreach program. They're actually able to provide immediate long-term um, uh, services to any of our veterans that are homeless. and uh, and we've we've had a lot of fantastic successes working with them and, and getting people out of those um, dangerous riverbeds. And one of the things that that is important too is is we actually walk the riverbeds um, on a weekly or biweekly uh, basis, and we actually talk to a lot of these individuals as part of our outreach groups um, because it's important for us to try to understand what brought them to being homeless. And and a lot of times they're actually very open about it and willing to to discuss their particular situation and it helps us have an understanding of how they got there and what can we do to help solve this problem and a lot of it is um is uh through <clears throat> through that partnership um such as alcohol substance abuse and, and mental health services um and I guess I looked, there's a, a quick question in the chat. How did we build this outreach? And, and it was just over time, over the last several years, we made connections, we built these um, relationships with these groups and we invited them to come out with us. And we've never been told no, uh, these, these outreach groups are, are here to help. Um, and a lot of times if they don't know what they don't know. And if they don't have access to these particular lands um, because we've never brought it up to them, um, they'll, they'll never go out there. So it's worked really well for us um, in, in trying to get people assistance. And, you know, when we're doing, when we're talking about homeless encampment management, uh, which is, you know, I know, it's a terrible word to say management. It's when you're doing these outreach and, and, and reaching out to these unsheltered populations, um, it's, it's really a community effort. I mean, it takes a full village and um, there's a lot, lot of services and resources we don't have, and we do rely on these outreach groups to help us out. Uh, next, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the good part. Um, I know I only have about seven minutes left or so, but I, I really wanted to highlight um, this interagency collaboration that we created back in 2022. And just to give you a backstory. Um, in California, we had a uh, atmospheric river uh, event coming through, and I knew there were several camps uh, within the Los Angeles River and the San Gabriel River um, that, that I felt might have been threatened. And so I was on the phone and I was cold calling different agencies, seeing who, who uh, could help us out to evacuate these individuals because we felt that the water um, the the uh, the ordinary high water mark was going to go up even higher and uh, they would be at risk of uh, drowning. And I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way to do this. So I did reach out to our Silver Jackets team within the Los Angeles district, and we came up with this plan uh, to create a workshop to invite different partners within Los Angeles County, Orange County, and the state of California 
and we kind of highlighted some project deliverables that we wanted to create. So we wanted to come up with an emergency response coordination uh, workshop with those agencies and different nonprofit partners that we listed below or, or before. We wanted to create a protocol for Army Corps owned and operated infrastructure on that emergency evacuation. And then we also wanted to strengthen our partnerships and our communications with those key agencies. So we, we held a big workshop. We had a total of 64 different agencies that committed uh, to this workshop. And the outcome was we created the Los Angeles District's Joint Protocol for Emergency Evacuation in July of 2023. And it, it works. It's really simple. It, it's basically just a phone tree with areas of responsibility. It's a living document. So as uh, different individuals or different agencies take over different um, um, jurisdictional areas, they're able to notify us of those changes. And so this living document is constantly being updated uh, with the latest information. And so when we do have an event um, where there's a storm, we we coordinate with our own reservoir operations center, with our emergency management area. We use uh, RAS modeling, hydraulic topographic modeling, and we determine what areas are um, at highest risk for flooding. <clears throat> with our internal knowledge of those uh, encampments within Army Corps property, we're able to coordinate with the responsible jurisdictional area and immediately go out there and offer services and evacuate those individuals. The last thing we wanted to do is to have somebody evacuated and dropped off at a corner uh, 7-Eleven and, and told see you later, because I know that, that that's not going to work. Um, they may have escaped the immediate danger, but I was looking for something more long-term. So we developed a, a, a simple Excel spreadsheet in which we were able to get feedback from those outreach service agencies on what type of housing were they provided, how long, uh, where is that housing provided, and what is the plan to provide more interim or long-term housing solutions for those individuals. Because the key really is, is to elevate those individuals out of homelessness. And so we take this approach with, you know, it, I, I call it a care driven approach. And we take this approach to elevate those folks out of homelessness because the last thing I want to see is to see them return. And there is a high recidivism rate with uh, returning individuals. Um, <clears throat> so we were able to activate that or create that joint protocol in July of 2023. And it was very apropos because what happened in Los Angeles in August, the very next month, who would have thought we would have had a damn hurricane? <laughs> so we had a uh, tropical storm Hillary. It was obviously reduced to a, a tropical storm in August of 2023. We were able to activate um, our emergency protocol. We contacted um, different agencies in the areas that we determined were at highest risk. And if you can go to the next slide, Danae, I think we have a good picture there of our group. And we were able to partner the evacuation of uh, 89 individuals that were unhoused within Santa Fe Dam and the San Gabriel River. Out of those 89 individuals, 65 of those individuals accepted housing. I mean, that is huge. We, we rarely get maybe 5 or 10% accept services. We understand that, that a lot of times they're, they're housing resistant. But to have this level of, of acceptance was unheard of. Um, we had a, a collaborative team of approximately 35 law enforcement partners. We had in, uh, mounted, unmounted uh, law enforcement. We walked out throughout the whole riverbed. We made contact over a period of two days. We had airships coming out there, um, highlighting evacuation notices. And we were lucky, we were lucky. We, were, we had a two or three day warning to put this thing together. We worked with our outreach partners. We were able to uh, rent out an entire hotel and we were able to do on-site processing, got everybody housing waivers um, and, and, and put into housing. Furthermore, all 65 of those individuals were given 
your inner house phone ticket. And there's actually several people that I, I've met since then uh, who got cleaned up and are living a normal life now. And it, it's just, it, it was just so fantastic to see. I mean, this job is very thankless. Um, and sometimes you feel that you're not making an impact at all. But to see those folks safe, um, to see them thriving uh, uh, because of our care driven approach really made uh, everything that we do so rewarding. Um, one of the important things to note is after these big kind of emergency evacuations and cleanup, you want to continue to do your post cleanup activities, right? So if you just kind of forget about the area, uh, a lot of times you'll have some groups come back. We did, we had about 15 individuals try to come back and re-domicile in this uh, very dangerous uh, riverbed. Um, we immediately had weekly and bi-weekly uh, patrols with our local law enforcement partners and our outreach services. Um, all 15 of those individuals were actually placed into intermediate housing solutions. And um, to this day, we continue, uh, we're at a, a bi-weekly um, pace right now, but uh, that entire riverbed and, and the area that we evacuated, we're proud to say that over the last year, we've been able to maintain that domicile free. There's zero uh, encampments there. We spent, I think about another $500,000 to clean up the debris and some of the footprints uh, and, and, and floatable debris from those camps. And we were able to restore that whole area back to its original state, which is just so fantastic. And uh, this Silver Jackets project and team made all that happen. So uh, I'm super grateful for, for Silver Jackets and for our partners. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I, I just wanted to put uh, Julio Ramos's point of contact. I'll put my contact in the chat and I'll try to go through and and answer any questions that you may have. And I think we're gonna have a Q&A period uh, afterwards, but um, I could have talked a lot longer. In fact, I see I, I went a little too long here, but um, we have an opportunity, a really unique opportunity within our, um, our, our function of flood risk management to make a big impact and to make a big change. And so if anybody has any questions, you can reach out to Julio, you can reach out to me. I have a lot of best practices, learned a lot over the, uh, over the years. I've made a lot of mistakes as well. And so I definitely would want to share that knowledge and uh, make sure somebody doesn't make the same mistakes that we did. Um, but uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and Danae, thanks for allowing me to come out and speak to you all today. Um, sorry you couldn't see my, my bearded face for too long, but uh, it was a pleasure and hope everybody has a, a great rest of your week. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Trevor. And feel free if you want to turn your camera on, uh, we can, uh, that, that's great um, now. And I see Andrew has his hand up. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, Trevor, uh, that's a great project you and partnership. Uh, and that you said that was a Silver Jackets project. So I assume that was partially core funded and then partially in kind by local communities or how was the funding? How did that 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 break down? Trevor, if you're talking, we can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I'm not much of a money guy, Andrew, but um, it, it was partially funded through the state of California and partially funded through the Army Corps of Engineers. And, and we were able to, to get those commitments from those agencies um, and, and the support from those agencies uh, through that workshop and through follow-on communications. And, and Andrew, I'm more than happy to share with you our protocol and share with you our uh, living documents that we, we use for notifications of evac evacuation, so. Well, great, that, that sounds like an amazing project, so good job. Great, thank you, Andrew, and yeah, great that that will be shared, wonderful. All right, do we have other questions?
Yeah, Megan, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to um, highlight the great work that Trevor has done in the Los Angeles district. And I think one of the interesting things that we found out when we had, um, there was the U.S. Council on, the Interagency Council on Homelessness come and visit from D.C., is we found out that there's a lot of state and federal help that you can get with cleanups, especially um, more creative ways to do it. Um, for example, um, we learned that we can get funding to help with unsheltered outreach and removal in areas where there's sensitive habitat. Uh, we were using a lot of our operations funds where, you know, to do um, unsheltered outreach and, and cleanup. And um, it was, you know, unable to go to other things, whereas we were able to realize this was another opportunity. So um, oftentimes, Sometimes we have budget shortages or we have to pull money from other places. So I think it's really um, key to talk to your state and federal partners on other ways to fund outreach, um, whether it's an urban area or rural area, especially their sensitive habitat and um, other ways to kind of build partnerships and be able to access resources from others. Hey, Megan, uh, you brought up a great point. Um, and if I can just kind of segue into what you said, we, we've been very successful with our collaboration with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Uh, we've had, uh, in fact, they came out and talked to us uh, back in November. We've, we have actually partnering with them on their Los Angeles County evacuation protocol as part of their all-in program. Uh, one of their uh, representatives for the Southern California area came out about a month ago and we shared with them our success and we currently are uh, assisting them in, in Los Angeles County Department of Emergency Management on their own joint protocol creation for uh, such a challenging task, right? I mean, it's very, very difficult, but you brought such a great point. I just kind of wanted to highlight that too. Uh, you know, we could probably turn this conversation into an hour long by itself, but uh, thanks so much for bringing that up. Yeah, thank you, Megan, for providing more information on the, the funding that's out there. And that is wonderful to hear that the good work is continuing to be done and just finding creative ways to um, create new plans and protocols uh, to help deal with this really challenging, challenging, complex issue. Okay, we have just a few more minutes if there are other questions for Trevor or Andrew. We have a, a chat uh, request from a request from Debbie uh, Needenreep for Megan, and she says, can you share contact info for the homeless interagency and their full name? I am going to um, have, if Trevor can do that, only because he has the more recent info. We met with a group of people, um, and it was back in November. And I don't know, Tre Trevor, if you can share your contact, that might be more appropriate, because we kind of just met with a, several people um but trevor might have the most recent thing i just think that they would be a great group to work with but i don't know the specific person at this time that trevor's working with yes more than happy to debbie i'll, I'll get that over to you i'll get your uh, contact information and um send out a, an email <clears throat> and then i don't know if, if if i properly answered your previous question in the chat on how those partnerships were built and and, and it was just cold calling, cold calling these different agencies, hearing about it. Um, hey, this agency provides, you know, these resources and inviting them out to come out with us. And now we have, uh, I mean, my phone has just got so many different people that I can pick up and they'll answer my call and, and we can collaborate together. So it just takes a lot of, a lot of, lot of work. And <clears throat> I guess for a, a lack of better words, kind of a grind you know, and building these relationships. Um, we're really unique in the Los Angeles district where we have such support. Um, funding is, is a big issue. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers and the US Army is not mandated to manage these sort of uh, homeless issues or people experiencing homelessness. 
And uh, it's an unfunded mission. So um, I don't go remove homeless camps for the sake of removing homeless camps. We have our own internal matrix and decision-making matrix where we take a look at um, the impacts of a particular camp um, because every dollar that I spend on a homeless encampment cleanup or outreach uh, is one less dollar than I'm supposed to be spending on maintenance of our infrastructure and, and our dams. And so I have, I have to be very uh, uh, cautious about ensuring that I'm spending my money wisely and I'm not taking something away that, that we need to do. So I hope that helps. Excellent, thank you. Thanks so much, Trevor. Yes, it does. Really good information. Appreciate it. All right, um, uh, we've only got five minutes left. I see Antoinette raised her hand. If you have a quick question, Antoinette, go ahead and come off mute. Thank you so much. It's so interesting. And I just wanted to um, point out that I am a CRS coordinator for FEMA regional office in um, Oakland, California for the region nine, which includes all of this area. And we're in the process of um, open comments for the CRS program and redesign. And I wanted to let people know, and perhaps there's opportunity to um, include these uh, details of the notifications that um, uh, were included in today's presentation within the credits for um, warning and notification systems. Um, I think it's relevant and it probably would um, provide credit. So I just want to let people know that that was an opportunity and um, I will put it in the chat. Um, uh, momentarily, there are some meetings coming up, but uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Antoinette, for that addition. Yeah, Antoinette, I would love to uh, love to learn more about FEMA's role. I, I do work with uh, Robert Adams in FEMA um, on on some issues, and so yeah, I look forward to uh, to hearing more about the work that you all do. Thank you. And Robert Lampa as well is our CRS state coordinator for California. And he would be very interested to have you come to the users group and speak on these issues. More than happy to share our experiences anytime. All right, with that, <clears throat> I wanna thank everybody for coming to our webinar today. And a huge, huge thank you to Trevor and Andrew for presenting on this, you know, such a broad issue, such a challenging issue. Just really emphasizing it's not just about the unsheltered individuals, right? This affects the community as a whole. It affects the ecosystem. Um, and so thank you for presenting, but also thank you for doing this super important work um, and just sharing what you've learned with the group. Um, and Trevor, it was really nice to hear about some positive resolutions as well. You know, a little hope in there as well. So with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. I'll have this recording up on the website on a Nevada floods. And it'll, I'm sure, end up on the Silver Jackets website as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. And anytime you guys need us to come out to Las Vegas. I'm, I'm always uh, open. <laughs> All right. Come on out. Right. There's the floodplain management Thanks. conference coming up in uh, September. September. Henderson. Yeah. Send me an invite. I'll be there. <laughs> Sounds good. Trevor, I, Trevor, I we need a 